Hello, today I'll be talking to you about my observations of street life in New York City's Chinatown. It's a neighborhood I've been looking at for the past 10-12 years during weekly visits to do my barber shop, to do food shopping, or to walk around. And it's one of my favorite New York City neighborhoods. And this is a drawing I made a few years ago of this area, the historic core of Chinatown, with 90 to 100,000 people, all in one place. So here we have the neighborhood bounded by Bowery, an old uh, Dutch road to the east of the neighborhood. We have Canal Street to the north of the neighborhood. And we have all of the commercial and, 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 and institutional buildings of Lower Manhattan that surround and tower over the neighborhood to the west and south. So here we have the city jail. We have the city courthouses. We have the federal office building. We have um, the New York Supreme Court building. We have the courthouse of the Southern District of New York and the city jails. We have the Woolworth building, the municipal building, and the mid-century modern public housing projects for Chinatown, the headquarters of the New York Police Department, and towering above it all, the Freedom Tower or the, or the New World Trade Center. Here on this side, we have just uh, next to Bowery, we have the Confucius Plaza Apartments built a few decades ago. And here we have all the old tenements, the little old buildings of Chinatown with the early 19th century church of the uh, Transfiguration, a Roman Catholic church right in the middle of the neighborhood with Columbus Park just beyond. Mott Street running right down the center of the neighborhood through the middle. This is the uh, one of the entrances to Chinatown on Mott Street this side and Canal Street on the other and on the corner is the old uh, the old Merchants Association building that has those little characteristically Chinese features on the eaves that just turn up at the corners. What I really like about Chinatown is this idea of appropriation or the idea that you have an underused urban spaces that are taken over by the people for new uses for public uses. So here is an example of an old fortune lady uh, give, telling fortunes on the sidewalk across the street from the Columbus Park. Here we have a lady in her shopping cart. You see a lot of these kinds of shopping carts around Chinatown for food shopping. This is an image of culture trading, of the idea that it's different cultures mix in one place. So here we have a barber shop next door, and we have a, a sign in uh, Spanish and in English for the wet floor sign, and the main sign for the store is in Chinese and English. This idea of layering of different cultures all in one place, different languages, different people. Another example of appropriation is the idea of eyes on the street. It's a term that comes from Jane Jacobs' book on the American city. And here we have an old st stoop from an abandoned um, vacant store which says private property on it, but these two people on their lunch break are sitting outside the stoop. And the idea of eyes on the street is that uh, on old neighborhoods that are densely built up with low-scale buildings with lots of stoops and entrances, that there will always be eyes on the street, always be looking people looking out their windows and making sure that the street is safe. And for me, this image speaks to, quite literally, the idea of the city stoop and the idea of eyes on the street. This is another image of a, a shoe repair store beneath the Manhattan Bridge toward the uh, closer to the northern edge of the neighborhood. This is a, a shoe repair that's, that's just deep enough for a closet where the man and his partner work repairing shoes. It's an old utility closet that looks like they rent. Um, and for me, this speaks to the appropriation of spaces that are underused or underutilized um, for uses that they were not intended. Um, it's an idea of everyday urbanism, that government cannot legislate for all land uses, in this case a closet that becomes a business. Um, and that business flows out onto the street where customers can sit here on these two little stools, and the slippers are there. I don't know if they're for customers or for the um, business owners, but they speak to the idea that the business has taken over the sidewalk and has given this area, this otherwise dead closet, a new meaning. Here's another store where the public sidewalk has been appropriated for the private uses of the business owner. 
This is another one of my favorite little artisans in Chinatown. It's a uh, man on Canal Street who sells these um, handicraft products that he folds from paper wreaths into the shape of different animals, like mice, like the different animals on the lunar calendar, ox, mice, rabbits, etc. And in the distance here we have different businesses. So we have the little trinket shops all up and down Canal Street here, and here we have a corner jewelry shop. So different audiences of people, different kinds of businesses for different kinds of people. And here we have uh, an image of squash. So a lot of the businesses pour out onto the sidewalk and they'll store goods during the day on the sidewalk. So this is some squash for sale, um, or that it will be has been left on the sidewalk and will be moved indoors. This is an image of jewelry for sale on Canal Street. It's a pig, a symbol of prosperity on the Chinese calendar. And here we have six little piglets hanging from her belly. <laughs> uh, I think it's a little bit gaudy, but many uh, Chinese people uh, rely on, on buying solid gold in lieu of making, um, instead of making financial investments in the stock market or the bank. This is an image of Columbus Park. Behind it is the um, city courthouses, New York's courthouses. And a lot of the old men here, and so fewer women, mostly men, uh, play mahjong, card games, and here we have another one of those little shopping carts that are so characteristic of Chinatown, and you see so many of them around the neighborhood. Here's a musician about to take a smoke break. And here's an image of tourists. So this isn't just a neighborhood for residents, a neighborhood for different age groups, as you see with the child on the bicycle here, and for different kinds of audiences. So a man in traditional garb taking photos with tourists alongside different residents right here. So here we have uh, an old lady, and this is a little, um, not an actual um, pet dog, but it's one of those little animatronic dogs that are often sold to tourists. In this case, we have those same shopping carts that people push around. So the signs right here, please do not litter, are in uh, English, in Spanish, and in Chinese, which speaks to the three largest uh, ethnic groups in the area, an older generation of Hispanics and the largest group of the Chinese. And then the little ornamental features on either end of the lamppost are little dragons, Chinese dragons. Here's a drawing I made of uh, a man who's brought his parrot to the park on his bicycle. And here's an image of uh, Eldridge Street, which is one of the oldest streets in, in, in the area. Um, so here we have uh, the street in the foreground from the colonial period. We have uh, a, a, a Greek Orthodox church right here. And here we have the Eldridge Street Synagogue. And surrounding all of these older businesses and the old tenements from the older generation, are the new Chinese businesses in the foreground. And then peering behind it all, here we see the rear window near the um, altar of the synagogue. This is the Eldridge Street Synagogue again, which is a, Jew a little Jewish synagogue, but is entirely surrounded by Chinese businesses. Chinatowns for me speaks to this idea of compression, the compression of history, the compression of people, the compression of time into one urban space. And I think that this image captures that idea of compression well with a zoom lens on the camera, all flattens all of the buildings into a single area. So here we have all of the old buildings right here with all of the fire escapes where often laundry hangs from these fire escapes and all the businesses in the foreground. And in the far distance rises the buildings of Lower Manhattan. Here we have two mid-century public housing projects, and then behind that is the Verizon's um, telecommunications switching tower near the Brooklyn Bridge, and even further than that is are the towers near Wall Street. And it speaks to this idea that you have this dense neighborhood of old buildings that are surrounded by often much newer buildings that physically surround and tower over the neighborhood. This is the jail belonging to the courthouse of the Southern District of New York. A lot of um, pretty famous criminals are held here. And it speaks to this idea that Chinatown is so close to uh, centers of power and oftentimes centers of oppression. So this building on a pretty uh, bleak looking street is right next to Chinatown, the neighborhood, this vibrant urban area. 
and walking by the street right here, oftentimes um, you'll see, sometimes you'll see people waving up to um, their relatives or their friends who are confined here while those friends pound on the windows to say hello. So there is, there are, there is a human drama to this neighborhood. This is a view of the courthouses just one block away from Columbus Park. The neighborhood looks entirely different. It's a totally different kind of feeling that you get from these powerful, some somewhat even oppressive um, civic and municipal buildings. So here we have the municipal, the municipal building of uh, New York City. We have another courthouse. Beyond that, we have Frank Gehry's, one of Frank Gehry's skyscrapers. And then in the foreground, there are the subway grates. This is an image from uh, the courthouse you saw in the previous frame. Uh, this is the image view from the courthouse looking back out, out over Chinatown. In the foreground is uh, Columbus Park and Mulberry Bend. This is, was one of the first urban renewal projects in New York City. In the far distance, we have the beautiful arc of the suspension of the Manhattan Bridge, and just beyond that, a little sliver of the East River. And between the, the East River in Columbus Park, we have all this dense concentration of buildings, layer upon layer of buildings, different ages, different land uses, different types of buildings, from uh, the Knickerbocker public housing projects right here to an old school building, and in the middle of it all, the Church of the Transfiguration, a Roman Catholic church in the middle of the neighborhood. And Chinatown for me is not just about uh, the building, the built environment, it's also about food and the centrality of food and cooking to Chinese culture. This is an image that you find a lot in Chinatown of poultry hanging in the storefront window for sale. Or fish for sale, or sometimes even frogs for sale. This is an image of a lady doing trash collecting. So she's tr collecting cans that she'll resell for a profit as part of her income. There are a lot of New Yorkers that do collect uh, used cans for, as part of a uh, source of income. I've seen this same person as far north as um, 14th Street, as Greenwich Village, and as far south as Chinatown. And Chinatown speaks to all cycles of food production and food disposal, from this lady uh, who's manufacturing noodles in one of those similar storefront kind of uh, windows like their, her, her neighbor down the street who's repairing shoes. Here's another image of uh, food shopping in Chinatown. We have uh, the business right here that has expanded onto the sidewalk and stores some of their produce for sale here. We have what looks like to be Hispanic or Latino family doing shopping here, all while people walk by. And just next to this business, uh, in the previous image, are all the foods, all the food and vegetable sellers uh, who line the sidewalk. So walking down on either side of the sidewalk, on one side you'll have the official businesses of the official business of the official New York City economy. On the on, on the other side you'll have the more unofficial economy of street vendors. You particularly find along this little stretch of Canal Street near Mulberry. This is the view on uh, Mulberry Street. And for me, it's not just uh, a Chinese neighborhood, it's also a Vietnamese neighborhood right here, as we'll see from the name, as well as the idea as the advertisement for money transfer, supposedly back to many of the communities that these people come from. And then on the other side of the street, you see the green in the far distance of um, Columbus Park, and then the restaurant that sells vegan food. So you have this whole layering of different types of land uses, different types of ethnicities, cultures, and people, all in one neighborhood. Here's an, Im an image, a drawing I made of one of those ladies doing her weekly food shopping. And here's a, a Chinese Hispanic grocery, which speaks again to that layering um, of languages and people. In the turn of the 20th century, this neighborhood was majority uh, Jewish, Italian, large numbers of German and Irish. But in the mid-20th century, a lot of Hispanics arrived in the Chinatown neighborhood, um, followed by uh, a lot of more Chinese who arrived in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s. And uh, a lot of the neighborhood businesses, like this business, adapted and called themselves now a Chinese Hispanic grocery, 
which speaks to this kind of unusual layering of cultures in New York City, the idea that two countries on opposite corners of the world who seemingly have nothing to do with each other, at least in this one instance of Chinatown, uh, these two cultures come together and coexist quite peacefully in one place. And that is something that is so unique and in some ways so beautiful about New York City. Here's an image of uh, Chinese New Year celebrations. And this is one of my favorite images of an older man who, has, who carries uh, an American flag and to participate in the procession of the Chinese New Year Festival. And then for me, this raises questions of how identity is not something that is solved, but it's something that is in flux. And it raises a larger question of what does it mean to be a Chinese American during Chinese New Year? Or what does it mean to be uh, a Chinese in America having an American flag, participating in a Chinese kind of festival. This is a uh, laundry hanging from uh, one of the old tenement facades. So uh, I like this image a lot because it reminds me of the old photos of uh, Jakob Rees, who took photos of many of the uh, buildings in this neighborhood that show laundry hanging from the old uh, stoops, the old fire escapes, and the turn of the century. And it really surprises me how more than a century after uh, those, photog those photographs were taken, uh, a lot of the similar, many of the kinds of uh, laundry still hangs from outside, and many of the sweatshops are still here. So it speaks to this idea that the demographics and the ethnic groups might change in this neighborhood, but there is a certain kind of permanence to that immigrant experience and to the way that these old buildings are continually used by different and new generations of immigrants in New York City. Similarly, we have an image here of a parking lot. So this is a parking lot with what looks like an old Italian owner on Bayard Street across from Columbus Park um, with only room for 12 cars right here, right next to what is now a largely Chinese neighborhood. And so you have this kind of little holdout of an older generation kind of business or land use in a largely Chinese neighborhood. Here we have the, another example of that mixing of cultures. We have the Paris restaurant. So obviously uh, France colonized Vietnam and apparently one of the Vietnamese immigrants who arrived in Manhattan calls the restaurant after Paris. And it speaks to this kind of almost bizarre idea that in a single tenement building that has housed generations of Italian immigrants, there is a Vietnamese restaurant in Manhattan that is named after the city of Paris. And that kind of layering is something that is so unique to New York City. This is an image from the inside of the Church of the um, Transfiguration. It was built in the early uh, 19th century as a um, Lutheran church. Lutheran is German, um, and it was a largely German and Irish and Italian neighborhood. And now the congregation is Christian still. The congregation is entirely uh, Chinese, with the Christian mass held in Mandarin and Cantonese all with the American flag right next to the altar. And it speaks to this idea that you have in one place, in one building actually, this layering of Christian identity with Chinese culture, with um, American values and German history. This is another watercolor I made of the neighborhood. The neighborhood has a whole range of different buildings, different land uses, different types of buildings, different ages. And so the buildings and the type of uh, land uses are as diverse as the people and history of this neighborhood. Here's an old man crossing Canal Street. And in this distance right here, you have a business, Bus 95 at 95 um, Canal Street, which advertises cheap bus tickets to um, places like uh, New York, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Another one of those kinds of unofficial businesses um, that have taken over the neighborhood, or in this case, use a lot of the sidewalks for selling of their bus tickets, even though it isn't a bus terminal. So it speaks to the unofficial economy that is so visible in New York City neighborhoods, and particularly in Manhattan, Chinatown. Uh, the neighborhood is particularly good for street watching. I don't know what this man is thinking, though. <laughs> Uh, 
another theme about Chinatown is the idea of reflection. And I think reflection for me is um, works on multiple levels. It's the idea that the built environment of the neighborhood reflects the history and people who lived here. Um, it's also the idea that the shop windows themselves are a reflection of the kinds of businesses that are here. So here we have an example of a man looking at his reflection in the shop window and using the shop window as a mirror to pick his teeth with a toothpick while these traditional Chinese handicraft goods are on display. This is on Doyer Street, where there's a big major concentration of um, barber shops in the neighborhood. Here's one of my favorite images. It's an image in uh, right beneath the entrance to the um, Manhattan Bridge in its hotel. And this hotel has placed a traditional ancient kind of Chinese vase in the window. And what I really like about this is how the image of the city outside is projected onto the vase, how the image of the contemporary city is almost projected onto this history through the medium of the shop window, through the reflection of the shop window. And I love how this, there's this idea of the layering of different histories all in one place. So here's an example of another reflection. It's the reflection of the old tenements, the old six-story walk-ups in this neighborhood with their old fire escapes and laundry hanging that are reflected onto this new building. And above that rises right here, the reflection of the Confucius Plaza apartment tower. So here we have three buildings, three generations of architecture compressed into one frame through the reflection onto this Chinese business. The history of the tenements, the mid-century urban renewal of the apartment tower, and then the contemporary office building. Here's another example of a few businesses. So here we have uh, lanterns and traditional handicraft products for sale during Chinese New Year, next to food shopping, next to that, a convenience store. And again, we have the same little carrying cases for food shoppers. Here we have a laundry mat. And this laundry mat is another example of that layering. So here we have inside the laundry mat, we have a, a street sign right here, a little poster with uh, in the Spanish language. We have advertisements for um, Falun Gong um, performances. And next to all the laundry baskets that the customers use to do their cleaning. And this is in such a rich tenement neighborhood where this tenement goes back probably to the mid 19th century or late 19th century with these kinds of architectural details. So it's a much, it is not just a tourist neighborhood, it's a vibrant neighborhood, a living neighborhood, and it's so layered with history. And a lot of that kind of history is that threat from forces like gentrification that gradually eat away at the edge of neighborhoods like this one. And to close, here is a final image of that neighborhood again. So almost all the images you just saw were taken from within this few square block area of Chinatown. And so that concludes my little lecture, and thank you for listening.